our panelists could put their videos on. Um, and if you're speaking, we'll, uh, of course, go off mute. But for anyone who's a panelist and not speaking, please keep yourself muted. Um, I just want to say welcome to everyone here today. Um, I am so happy to see all these different answers in the chat. It sounds like we're all kind of in, you know, coming at this from slightly different angles. There, there seems to be a hunger to know more, more than anything else. And so my hope is that today, um, or a little bit more than an hour from now, you'll know more um, and feel like you're in a place to ask the right questions and build on, on what you've learned. So um, just to begin to kick this off, uh, I'm Kristen Schlemmer. I am the legal director and waterkeeper for Bayou City Waterkeeper. And I'm, I'm located in Houston. This is where I live. This is where I was born and raised. Um, and across this region, wherever we live, uh, we're surrounded by water in some form, um, whether it's a bayou, a creek, a river, a bay, or wetlands. And I, I believe that we deserve to live in a place where this water can be a source of both sustenance and joy. And I think a lot of what's happened over the last decade has changed that for many of us. We're one week away from hurricane season along the Texas coast. Harvey was nearly five years ago and people remain in harm's way across our region. Harris County um, has been investing billions in local flood protections and the federal government has promised to invest billions more in water infrastructure of all kinds. Yet across greater Houston and along the Texas coast, Communities have drainage infrastructure that isn't working, um, and we're continuing to build within floodplains and ecologically sensitive areas like wetlands and prairies, um, creating new flood risks. People remain at risk here. Climate change is here and increasing these risks, and we need serious action on multiple fronts now. Um, and we're here to discuss today a collection of infrastructure projects sometimes called the Ike Dyke or the Coastal Barrier, Coastal Spine. Um, and as you'll learn today, these projects are massive in scope. They'll take 20 years to build, require $31 billion to build, and another $100 million a year in maintenance costs. And while they will offer us some protection against storm surge, they won't address the flood risks that we know far too well. Um, I, sorry, just one moment. Um, our goal today is to help you understand what these projects are, um, what they will and won't do, um, the concerns the experts that are here with us today um, have about these projects, and other visions for how to address our region's climate risks and transition. Um, before introducing you to our speakers, just a little bit about logistics. Um, you can put questions in the questions and answer box. Um, Deborah at Turtle Island Restoration Network is helping us run all this Zoom, so let her know if you have any technical difficulties. Danielle at Bayou City Waterkeeper, that's Danielle Garcia, not Danielle Goshen, who's one of our panelists today, is helping keep an eye on the chat and the questions and answers, so you can also direct um, anything to her as well. And we will have time for questions later um, at the end of this. Um, you can also ask them throughout. And um, I'm going to be facilitating and can bring some of those questions into the conversation um, if it goes with the flow of what the speaker is talking about at that moment. Um, and speaking of the chat, uh, Danielle Garcia is going to add um, a form to the chat right now where you can sign up to stay up to date on the Ike Dyke and coastal infrastructure projects and opportunities to learn more or take action. We'll share this again at the end of this presentation, but putting it there now if you already know that you want to um, follow this a little bit closer, more closely. So now turning to our presentation. Um, today's panelists each have expertise that will help you understand the Ike Dyke and related infrastructure projects. I'm going to share a little bit more about them as they start to speak, but for now I'll just share with you their names um, and affiliations. And that's John Beard with the Port Arthur Community Action Network, Danielle Goshen with National Wildlife Federation, Chase Porter with Lone Star Legal Aid, and Danielle Goshen, oh sorry, <laughs> Joni Steinhaus with Turtle Island Restoration Network. 
Um, first, we'll turn to Joni so she can explain what we even mean when we use the words Ike to Ike. Um, and these are the projects outlined in the Coastal Texas study. Joni Steinhaus is a Galveston resident and the Gulf Program Director for Turtle Island Restoration Network. Joni has been actively involved in raising concerns about the environmental impacts associated with this project for years and knows all the different parts of this project really well. So Joni, I'm gonna turn this over to you. I'd love for you to just tell us more about what we're talking about when we use the words Ike Dyke. Excellent, thank you so much. And thank you everyone to all the participants that are with us today, I appreciate your time. So I'm going to share my screen. I think um, images will help. I'm sure some of you are very familiar with these. There we go. Everybody see my screen okay? Okay, excellent. All right, on the upper Texas coast, with the Coastal Study Texas, the General Land Office and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers are involved in. There are both bay and gulf hard structures. And all the images that I'm sharing with you today are available on this website, the www.coastalstudies.texas.gov. So you don't have to take screenshots. Um, you can go out and check it. There's multiple pages to look at these images and learn more about this project. So, um, as Kristen said, uh, the earliest this construction would begin would be 2025, and it would take up to 18 years to build both the hard structures in the bay and on the Gulf side. So completion of this project is as far away as 2043, and that's if funding is appropriated. And as she also shared with you, an estimated cost in October of 2021 was $31 billion for this project. And we all know with construction costs over time, that's only going to increase. And again, potential for earliest start date would be 2025. So looking from the Gulf of Mexico, this is looking into Galveston Bay. This project is a huge system of navigation gates that will extend a width of over two miles. And that's between Galveston Island and Bolivar. There's gates and pump systems on the western portion of Galveston Bay, and that's in the top left image of uh, part of this image. And there's also a ring barrier that's proposed for around Galveston Island and 43 miles of twin dune systems on Bolivar and also in Galveston that will extend west of the existing seawall on Galveston Island. The largest component of this project are, is the gate system at Bolivar Roads. This will allow for commercial vessels and also smaller recreational vessels. And you can see the image, the large vessels that will be able to go through in this area and the recreation vessels would go through on either side of this large gate system. This structure would uh, require the deepening of this portion of the ship channel by 60 feet it would change the flow in and out of the bay. It would change the velocity of the bay and turbulence would be created near this hard structure. When we've seen presentations over the years since this was first proposed, they often refer to the Netherlands and systems in the Netherlands. The structures that are in the Netherlands are located in reinforced canals 10 to 20 miles from the open water of the North Sea and they're protected from any major hydrodynamic forces, as well as sedimentation because of their location in the canals. They do not experience anything remotely close to the force of a major hurricane that would happen at the opening of this major bay system. I'm gonna go through different portions of each gate. In the top, it's highlighted in red. And so this is referred to the, as the sector gate. The gate will be closed as demonstrated on the left image during a storm. The concerns are, how will it be opened after a storm? Will sediment be washed up and affect the opening? Will there be computer failures in the system? Will, will there be so much debris trapped behind it, they won't be able to open these gates? The power, will it be out? Will generators, backup generators fail? There was a presentation from a gentleman, his name is Mark Walgraven. He came to Galveston pre-COVID, and he is the Senior Storm Surge Barrier Advisor for Dutch Infrastructure and Water Management Agency. I have some quotes from him during his presentation in Galveston. 
things will happen with these kinds of structures. He stressed that there will be unplanned, unbudgeted, sometimes dangerous, dangerous, urgent repairs and modifications will be needed at extraordinary expenses to fix. The navigation channels that you're viewing, there's concern for the vessel traffic and operators. He quotes, not if, but when the gates will be hit by vessels. Other projects in the Netherlands have had ship strikes with costly maintenance and then testing operations of these gate systems, which shut down the shipping traffic. So similar to the structures in the Netherlands, he also stated that these structures have devastating environmental impacts on the bays and estuaries. The vertical lift gates, as you see in the top right, they are located next to these sector gates and they can be used in water that is shallow as six feet in depth. There is a large amount of sediment that was deposited after Hurricane Ike in these specific areas. And so similar to the sector gates, the same concerns are with vertical gates. Will the sediment build up behind these gates? Will they be able to open? Will there be equipment failure, computer failure, power outage, generators? They predict that there'll be annual maintenance, but in this type of condition, with this structure exposed to continuous salt water, it's hard to imagine there won't be additional maintenance needs that will arise. The vertical lip gates tie into this come by wall that will be in front of Port Bolivar. As you see on the screen, it is 22 feet high. It will run from one mile from, front tra from Port Travis in front of Port Bolivar. Again, referring back to the Netherlands, there is a structure similar. The Hartel Canal structure has two vertical gates. This system has proposed 15 vertical gates in Galveston Bay. And again, the same similar concerns, debris, sediment, failure to open with all these gate structures. The combine wall will tie into three miles of earth and leaven, as you see in this structure. This is Joni, view. sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to um, pause real briefly. We've been getting some feedback about um, the sound. I think it's papers you're holding or oh, um, creating some feedback on the microphone, but no, it's okay. I just wanted to let you know. Um, okay, excellent. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> sorry about that, everyone. So on these combine gates, um, no project of this complexity and size has ever been built across a symbol coastal inlet in the world. The examples in the Netherlands, again, are separate structures on different inlets. They do not experience the same surge energy or sediment action as would experience in the mouth of Galveston Bay. There's not a comparable project in scale or wave or surge energy that exists in the world. And the Netherlands do not have structures that could be potentially impacted by a corrupt category five hurricane. I'm not able to advance. Let's see. There we go. Another part of this project is an enormous double line of dunes that would run 43 miles. There would be 18 miles added to the existing seawall in Galveston running to the San Luis Pass and an additional 25 miles that would be built on Bolivar. This twin dune system would have 14 feet of dune landward and then the 12 feet of golfward dune system. And that's demonstrated in that top image. And for this dune structure to be sustainable, it would need to have that 165 feet in front of it. This is not realistic or sustainable for the upper Texas coast. They have not identified a good sand source and there really isn't enough sand source that they're now considering a hard core is being researched and considered for the structure. Again, the beginning of this construction 10, 15 years out at the absolute soonest. And these areas on the upper Texas coast, they have a high erosion rate. We need continuous beach nourishment. And the core projects the estimated cost for this project on Galveston at $378 million and on Bolivar at over $710 million. The draft proposal also 
includes increasing the height of the seawall. The existing seawall runs 7.7 .7 miles. They would need to increase it by three to four feet so that it would be 21 feet high. This image is at 28th and seawall. That wall does exist. So they would need to build similar structures in front of existing structures and then also have structures that would be brought in to close 34 roads along the seawall during a storm. The Galveston ring barrier is a system of floodgates, pump stations, and levee sections. It would surround Galveston 15.8 square miles. The maximum height of the flood wall would be 14 feet. There would be 34 gates, as I stated, across roadways and seven gates that would need to be built around railways. And also a sector gate right here in Offutt's Bayou would need to be added. There would be additional draining structures and pumping systems to remove any excess water. The last two structures that would need to be built would be the structures on the western portion of Galveston Bay. This image is a 70 foot, 75 foot floating sector gate in the southernmost inlet at Clear Lake. A flood wall that would be at the elevation of 17 feet. It would start west on the west side of State Highway 146 near NASA Road 1 and end on the south side near Marina Bay Drive. The last sector gate would be a 100 foot wide gate at the entrance to Dickinson Bayou. A pumping station would be constructed. It would tie into the land with an 18 foot flood wall. And this one would start on 146 at Avenue T and end on the south side of the bayou near Waterman's Harbor. Those are the end of the hard structures that they're proposing. And again, all those images are available on the Corps website. There are tremendous environmental impacts that are not full, fully studied or known at this time. And they include that this area is extremely important, natural area and a bird habitat where a major migratory flyway. We're concerned about water quality, the change in tidal prism, the volume of water in and out of the bay would be decreased. We're concerned about the tidal range, the difference between the high and low tide would be decreased. This would negatively impact tidal marshes by changing the inundation frequency. The effects on adult fish, shellfish, larvae, and movement in and out of the bay cannot be fully understood. Unknown economic impacts to our fisheries. Again, sand availability for the dune system that's proposed and a sand source have not been fully identified. And the impacts on large species such as dolphins and sea turtles is not known. So Kristen, that's the end of my section. I don't know if we want to do questions and answers or move on. Yeah, I have I have a couple of questions. Um, when you were talking about the cost of this project, um, is this all, where does this funding come from? Is this all federal funding or um, is some of that coming from us? So absolutely, there would there is a proposal for some federal funding, but there's also something called the Gulf Coast Protection District, and they need a non-federal partner. So that is a state partner. And there would be five counties that would be in this protection district. They call it a protection district, but it's actually eminent domain and a taxing authority. The maintenance on this project is projected to be over $131 million a year. And so the state needs to assist the federal government or eventually take on full responsibility and maintenance of this structure. And I read a figure, um, you know, showing in terms of like counties contributing their share that that primarily comes from raising like property taxes. Is that right? Or whatever mechanisms counties have for raising money. Um, so this would be so in Harris County, it was um, something about like 10 to 11 billion dollars, I think, was the cost that we would be expected to provide. And um, just to kind of understand the scale of that in 2018, we authorized a um, $2.5 billion flood, flood bond. So this will be more than four times larger than that. And Danielle, were you going to add to that? Yeah, that's um, so for the federal projects, um, there's a 35% cost share of that $31 billion. So that altogether for um, the, the counting or the, the county um, 
entities that's going to be around 11.7 billion dollars and that might be spread across the five county taxing authority thank you and yeah Joni most of my questions for you are about the environmental impacts and I think you answered those really well um, so I'm going to turn to John Beard now and um, John as I said earlier is with Port Arthur Community Action Network. He's a Port Arthur resident, and um, his organization is an environmental justice advocacy and community development organization. And John, I'd love to hear more from you about um, how your community is looking at risks from infrastructure, major storms, and climate change, and what your concerns with this proposal are um, in particular. Thank you, Kristen. Good afternoon, everybody. As Kristen mentioned, I'm John Beard here in Port Arthur, Texas, and I am the founder and CEO of PACON, Port Arthur Community Action Network, which is an environmental, social justice, and community development organization. And when I heard about this proposed Ike Dyke, which really started after Ike, but also was highlighted even more so due to Harvey, I immediately began to have a lot of concerns for my community, especially because Ike caught everyone so unaware and by surprise, not Ike, but Harvey, until it became obvious that our flood control system as well as our drainage system was inadequate. And when you consider the fact of the intensive petroleum industry we have here and the build out that's being proposed as well as ongoing, that there are also serious clim climatological changes and impacts that have to be considered. As you heard Joni mention, and as you probably heard all along the Gulf Coast, areas like Port Arthur that have a seawall to protect it from the intrusion of the Gulf or looking at to be looking at being elevated or raised. And so they're talking about even putting in more structures to the east of me in Orange County, between here and the Louisiana state line. They're also talking about a levy of some sort. And they are once again, eminent domain and environmental and eco ecological and economic issues involved. The taxes from this are staggering. This is only what we know that they're going to be today, but we also know that uh, government bodies never met a tax they didn't like and taxes are going to increase. And then we also have to look at the environmental justice issue. A number of these communities have substantial numbers of BIPOC people, people who are black, uh, Indian, and other peoples of color. And those communities are largely economically disadvantaged. So a disproportionate burden would be placed on them for this protection system. Also, what has to be considered is the overall impact. Uh, as Joni said and highlighted quite well, we don't know what those total impacts are going to be, but we can anticipate what some of them are. And we can anticipate them looking at what's currently happening and what's going on in these areas. Uh, we're having subsidence. We're also having the flooding that comes from not just hurricanes, but even when we have strong southwesterly winds from the Gulf of Mexico, tides do rise in, in, in addition to that. So those things have to be considered, but the environmental impact and the environmental justice impact on impoverished communities and how it would affect them who are already have drainage problems has not been addressed fully. There's a saying in, in one of the movies I like, and I think it's in the Jurassic Park series. Jeff Goldblum says, no matter what men do, that nature finds a way. No matter what we do, nature finds a way to overcome that. And we are constantly in a struggle back and forth with nature. And as was said earlier, we want to live in coastal low-lying areas. We respect the beauty of it, but there's an inherent danger in locating in those areas. And we want to populate those areas heavily, and when we do that, you have to insure the properties. So now you've got a, another economic aspect to look at. When you see the damage that's done and how much it costs to help people who are in the line of fire of these storms and these floods. What we have to do is not create artificial means of trying to control nature, which we will not be able to afford and which will be economically untenable. Or as I read or heard earlier, the term of unintended consequences. An unintended consequence is going to be that we don't really know what the costs are going to be like and, and where they're going to end up. And we don't know fully what the impact is going to be. But what we do know is that communities right now are suffering because of inadequate drainage. 
And the flood protection, while significant for those areas and necessary, can't be involving of what's happening to Galveston Bay. Galveston Bay is crucial. And when we accept, when we up, upset rather, the ecological inflow and outflow and the effect it's going to have on native species, it's gonna have a direct effect on all of our lives. And it's gonna have a direct effect on people more specifically. So we're going to have to really look at this hard and consider it. But right now, it seems to be, as I said, a boondoggle. It seems to be a question in search of an, not in search of an answer, but an answer in search of a question. Why are we doing this? What is the cost benefit ratio for it? And it's being driven not by the needs of people, but by the needs of the petrochemical industry. They are the ones who are contributing to this with climate change and global warming, that's affecting all communities. And now they want a solution that they're going to make the general population and citizens pay for. Mind you, in my area, as I'm probably sure in others, uh, industry does not really directly pay property taxes if it's assessed that way. Nor do we know if they're going to be part of this taxing district that is going to be put together in order to sustain this over the lifetime of this project if it's built. So there are a number of questions in so many areas that have yet to be answered, but the most serious one of which is, what is it going to do to people? How is it going to affect our lives and the ecology of the Gulf Coastal communities? And in my estimation, this is a project that is far overblown. It's a project that is not going to address our problem because nature is gonna find a way. They'll build the seawall up like they built here back in the 50s, but now we're looking at having to raise it because of climate change and global warming. So as I close, let's try to be mindful and look at all of these issues in their totality. It's not just an isolated thing of we have this problem and here's the solution. Those solutions have unintended consequences. And without further studying them and knowing all of what they are, simply accepting what we hear from the core and what we hear from po politicians and other governmental officials is insufficient. We will have to make this decision and we'll have to make it on the best available information, but yet also understand that as much as we do, it's probably still not going to be enough to protect all of us. Because what happens while we protect us from the storm surge, what happens when you have a Harvey? You've got water falling in the bowl that now you've got to get out. And how do you pump it out when the tide's high or water's coming in? Those are unanswered questions. There are probably many more. But once again, thank you for this opportunity to speak to these issues on this project. And uh, we're going to continue to try to help inform the public, as I'm sure all of you are, and to have a sense of common sense and reason come into this play and not simply just make this about industry, but make it about people. Thank you. Thank you for that, John. Um, I'm gonna turn now to Chase Porter, who you know well. Um, he's an attorney at Lone Star Legal Aid and he worked with John along with residents um, from the Ship Channel and Freeport areas to address environmental injustices created by the Ike Dyke related projects. Um, and this was you know, during several comment periods that have been open to the public that we all, um, the panelists here in front of you participated in. So Chase, could you, could you let us know um, more about how this project presents concerns relating to environmental justice? Absolutely, thank you, Kristen. As Kristen said, I, my involvement in Lone Star Legal Aid's involvement was to represent a, a number of clients along the Gulf Coast in front of the Army Corps of Engineers. We help them at, at public meetings and we've filed several rounds of public, written public comments with the Army Corps of Engineers raising uh, many concerns, but at the heart of that is environmental justice concerns. Our clients, um, whose voices uh, I focus every day on elevating, were a shrimper. Um, I see that Chase is frozen. Let's see if he comes back in just a second here. If not, we may have to jump ahead to Danielle Goshen and we'll circle back to Chase when he's back on. And yeah, I'm gonna say, let's do that. So Danielle, I'll introduce Danielle. Um, 
And then we'll come back, hopefully come back to Chase when he's back on the Zoom. Um, but Danielle Goshen is a policy specialist and counsel at National Wildlife Federation. Um, and she's developed expertise in prioritizing investments that work with nature to protect the people most at risk from flooding and climate change with a lot of um, work in the Houston area and um, with a special um, focus too on this project. So Danielle, could you share more about this project from the perspective of climate change? Um, what do we need to know? Absolutely, thank you, Kristen. Um, so as John and Joni mentioned, uh, we don't know the full impacts of this project right now. Um, and we don't know the full impact of those of these projects because um, the Army Corps has undergone what is called a tiered NEPA review, um, where they're essentially asking for money now and they've done some preliminary studies on the impacts, but we won't know those full impacts until all of those other, um, all the components of the projects that we have talked about today have undergone um, extensive environmental impact statements. Um, none of those uh, components that we have already discussed are actionable today because uh, they still need to go undergo further review. Um, so one day, you know, as, as from our perspective at NWF, we may want to support some large scale coastal protection project. Um, but we want to do that after understanding and accounting for impacts uh, using robust science. And so uh, we also can't do that, though, at the expense of communities. Uh, communities need protection now and not 20 years down the line at the soonest. So looking at what we do know, um, what the final report does provide, there are some big concerns from a climate change perspective. Full disclosure, I am a lawyer and not a climate scientist. However, my colleague, Dr. Arsene Patak at National Wildlife Federation is a climate scientist and has provided us with extensive notes. Um, but first, the Army Corps used lower end emission scenarios for land subsidence and sea level rise estimates. Um, it is a concern for a project of this magnitude, cost, scale, and time to be based on these best case or lower emission scenario projections. Uh, the low estimates of sea level rise and storm surge assumes a drop in greenhouse gas emissions and policies um, that you know, are supposed to curb uh, emissions over, over the next couple decades. However, at this point, that is a very rosy outlook. Specifically for land subsidence, the Coastal Texas study assumes variable and low rates of subsidence in the Galveston Bay area. Land subsidence, while varying locally across the region, is still changing quickly in the Houston and Galveston area due to local changes um, in sediments and hydraulic properties of uh, the aquifer systems in our area and groundwater extractions from those systems. With decre decreasing uh, groundwater levels and accompanying uh, extraction rates or the rates of subsidence are likely to increase. And recent studies by Lou et al. suggest that a, an extreme um, sea level rise scenario is better used to account for that subsidence in flood mitigation planning. So now on sea level rise specifically, uh, the study uses an Army Corps 2013 intermediate scenario. Now this scenario correlates to NOAA's 2017 intermediate to low projections for sea level rise. The intermediate low scenario is most likely to happen um, and thus offers a, a very conservative lens for sea level rise projections. Again, this is assuming greenhouse gas, gas reductions in the area that we are not really, um, not really expected to see. Uh, so most of the latest research, including NOAA's 2017 and 2022 technical sea level rise reports, have leaned more towards an intermediate to intermediate high scenario for planning based off of the reductions that we've already been doing and expect to see over the next couple of decades. Additionally, there are similar concerns with flood risks. There, um, the, the Army Corps in this plan has looked at um, uh, a variety of different storm surge elevation or storm surge projections. Um, and on in their engineering report, there's um, they show that there's about a, a greater than 50% sur storm surge reduction in Galveston Bay when compared to um, without project conditions, meaning with the project, there's greater than 50% reduction. Um, and then without the 
versus then without the project. Um, so this was done running 170 synthetic tropical storm conditions. And, um, and they just, the only thing that they could say from that was that there's a greater than 50% reduction from the 100 year AEP storm. So, you know, this just raises big questions for us is, um, should we be willing to wait 20 years and pay $31 billion and, uh, for um, this 100 year storm system where it's only gonna pro provide greater than 50% reduction in storm surge? Um, another, a last point that I'll bring up is that 100 year uh, storm system that they are planning for is changing over time as well changes in climatology and spatial variations in storms um, can increase that return level. So really people are looking at that 100 year flood level that is supposed to occur, kind of we're seeing in this region occurs every one to 30 years in the Gulf of Mexico region. So the storms are changing, they're getting more frequent and they're planning for this 100 year um, event that is becoming more frequent in this area. So, you know, we just really need to ask hard questions of whether this investment and the, the time that it will take to build this project uh, is what our community needs. Are there quicker, cheaper ways that can help protect our communities now and not 20 years down the line? Um, and we just uh, wanna see a more nuanced discussion uh, in, about what, what we really wanna see for our region. Thank you, Christine. Thank you. And um, I'm going to turn it back to Chase now. I'm sorry we lost you, but we were able to seamlessly move to Danielle. So um, we're now very excited to hear from you. <laughs> sorry about that, everyone. It, it figures right in the middle of my big speech. Um, the internet would reset itself. Um, so as I was saying, I, my entire goal is to elevate the voices of the most vulnerable communities and individuals along our coast. Um, I just wanted to, to um, I'm going to jump in and, and go to a quick PowerPoint. Um, I hope you all can work here. So I just wanted to, to I, I think most people hey, kind Chase. of... Yes. I think if you could just turn this into like the presentation mode, um, that'd be great. So that it's like fills the screen. Just my personal preference. Sure, I I was trying to do that. Um, let's see if I can get there. There's like an icon. Oh yeah, you got it. Is that better? It, no, it's the same. It's, um, if think. you look at the icons, like at the bottom of the screen, uh, oh, but there's like the one that's all the way at the far right. I think that'll do it. But if not, it's fine. Okay. Thank you. Okay, sure. So I, I think everyone generally kind of has an idea of what environmental justice is, but I, I wanted to share uh, this wall of text just to to bring up uh, uh, a couple of concerns and that, that is environmental justice um, includes the fair treatment of everyone based on race, color, national origin or income, um, both when it comes to protection offered from environmental and health, other health hazards, but also equal access to decision-making. And so in this context that refers to um, is the Army Corps of Engineers um, actually connecting with environmental justice communities at a meaningful level? Are they having dialogues with those like John Beard and, and, and other clients of LSLAs and, and hundreds of thousands of other Texans that live in these communities? Um, on that point, up to now, I, I would just say they've, they've failed to do so. Um, we have a little bit of grace due to, to COVID makes that difficult, but we really hope moving forward um, that they will have that meaningful dialogue um, and actually have discussion about what these communities really need. Um, now I'll kind of focus on that first point and, and whether the US, the Army Corps of Engineers has um, really evaluated whether everyone is getting that same degree of protection from this plan. 
So first off, um, what is required of the Army Corps of Engineers? Uh, an executive order signed back in the 1990s requires them to identify and address um, disproportionate um, health and environmental effects um, to ensure that anything that they do, including the development of the Coastal Texas study, the construction and operation of its component parts, um, don't disproportionately um, affect low-income uh, communities and communities of color. Um, they're supposed to do a very detailed look at that before they move too far ahead. But up to this point, what has the Army Corps of Engineers done? They did a brief regional level socioeconomic analysis and essentially said um, in this entire region, only 16% of the population is low income. So we're not really concerned about that group. Um, as we all know, if you look broadly, you will dilute these populations and, and you know, is the United States a poor country? No, but does it have poor communities? Absolutely, and they need to be looked at, they need to be looked at closely, and they need to be involved. Um, and so our clients all um, voice the same opinion and, and, and to me and, and in our comments that um, we all know that these populations can reside in tightly clustered communities. Um, or unevenly distributed throughout um, the area. And that's certainly the case in, in, in around Galveston Bay and along the coast. coast there are these communities that are um, clustered and, and they really need to take a, a good hard look at how they're gonna be affected before they move forward with this plan. Um, that includes looking at long and uh, short-term concerns. Um, where, where are the construction zones gonna be? Are they gonna set up, um, um, are they gonna park their trucks? Are they gonna be doing construction um, on a block that is relatively low income? When these are actually built and operable, um, are they going to protect low income communities just as well as they protect other communities and in, in, in industry? Um, and then indirect impacts. We know there's gonna be a lot of negative indirect impacts from this, it's inevitable, it's gonna be covered well today. Um, but are those gonna be felt by my client who's a shrimper more so than those who are live in wealthier communities. Then I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here. Um, and so up to this point, as I said, the Army Corps of Engineers has really kind of pushed the EJ issue aside and that's really concerning. Um, they've told me in, in their response to comments and, and this is public that they'll look at this later in more detail, but we already know that they're um, looking at how to fund this. They've set up the, the protection district that will have taxing authority. We've already seen Congress authorize um, further study of this project and authorize possibly the construction of this project down the line. Um, and so it looks, it kind of feels like they're just pushing this forward and maybe we'll be too far down the line to really be able to take a hard look and for that to really be meaningful and impact the design of this. Now, um, there is one aspect I wanna to try to provide a solution. Um, and it's, you heard non-structural um, components mentioned, and that includes a plan to spend several hundred million dollars along Galveston Bay to weatherproof homes, elevate homes, make them wind and rainproof. Um, this is a great idea. Unfortunately, um, at the pace we're going and where they've slotted this into the plan, um, that won't take place for another two, three decades from now. And as Danielle was talking about, we know in the next 30 years, there's going to be numerous large storms that are going to hit this region. It's just going to happen. This is something that is cost effective. They're going to spend less than 1% of their whole budget on it and be able to directly help thousands and thousands of, of residents along the bay. It's proven, we know elevating a house, it's, it helps it not flood, right? Um, there's low risk to it. Um, it's, and it's going to directly help residents rather than um, building these huge structures um, that appear focused perhaps too much on industry and not enough on the community. It will help them directly. Um, and so I really hope that they will um, consider developing that, that program more um, and speeding it up. I think that's a huge flaw in this and that would really help environmental justice communities more so than the current plan. Um, there are some problems with that, like I said, the timeline. Um, we've also seen anytime it, it comes to one of these programs, 
we know that environmental justice communities have problems accessing the program. Um, Low-income communities, uh, you have to have clean title to your house. You have to be able to show that you own it. We know for a fact that lower income communities to really no fault of their own, but just simply a, a lack of access to the legal system, usually have trouble doing that. And so they have to spend a year or more working with Lone Star Legal Aid or another organization to clear title to their home before they can even get access to this program. And then it will take some amount of time for them to get assistance. Um, and then the execution of these programs. Um, after Hurricane Harvey, the uh, state of Texas was, was given considerable funds from the federal government um, to, to go into communities and, and weatherproof homes. And it's been several years on, very few people have gotten assistance. And so I, I hope that um, that will be taken seriously. They will evaluate that sooner rather than later and not continue to push that on. Um, and then lastly, I, I saw the comment and, and it's been raised now, can industry perhaps pay a little bit more for this? I don't know um, if they can make industry pay or not. Um, but what I do know is that the most vulnerable communities, those that really need this the most, um, those like Port Arthur, those um, like Pasadena, those um, communities out there along the coast um, that to no fault of their own have been developed in floodplains and, and um, have been not given access to um, economic opportunity. They need this the most. And um, the way it's set up is that uh, they will end up paying through it through tax dollars like the rest of us in this program. Right now, it doesn't look like it's going to help them as well as it should. Thank you, Chase. And um, I, I read the comment letter that and learned a lot from the comment letter that y'all submitted. And I was wondering if you could add a little bit more about um, air pollution during construction. I, I, I don't know if you touched on that yet, but I'd love to hear a little bit more about that. Absolutely. Um, so these are going to be massive, massive construction projects, right? It will involve um, all, you know, every type of construction, truck and, and vehicle, um, it will involve ships, construction boats and ships, I'm sure, um, to, to build these things. Um, and then the workers, of course, they have to drive to and from the construction site. Um, with that comes a lot of air pollution. Um, there is pollution directly from the equipment, from the cars, the trucks, the ships. Um, frequently, there's lots of diesel emissions from those. Um, there's emissions from generators. Um, they have to power their equipment, they have to, to keep these sites up and running and they're gonna be running for a, a decade or, or longer, depending on how quickly they can get this stuff built. Um, and so I mentioned earlier construction concerns and, and we're certainly concerned that during that period, um, you know, lower income communities, EJ communities in particular, um, are often located where it, it appears it may make sense for, for them to have larger construction operations. And so we're, we're concerned that they're going to have to bear the brunt of that um, for, for years. It's not just going to be um, a couple of months or, or it's not going to be a week of them fixing the street. Um, and so we're very concerned about that. And, and as I said earlier, um, these need to be thought of sooner rather than later. They need to get ahead of this and really think about how this is fully gonna impact those communities. Thank you for that. Um, we're gonna turn now to thinking about, you know, other visions for our coast. Um, and I just wanted to observe, you know, I think from some of the things we've heard today, I want you to understand that wherever you stand on the Ike Dike, I mean, some people I can tell from the chat are, um, know that they're opposed. Some people know they're in favor. Um, others are kind of still um, in an in-between place, but wherever you stand, um, this is not a silver bullet. Um, it's just designed to address um, storm surge um, in certain, you know, up to category three. Um, it won't address the flooding concerns we, we all have now. Um, and there's still a lot of unanswered questions and all of this is gonna come with costs. Um, and so 
I, I think these next speakers will help us understand what we could be doing right now. Um, and I think Chase already touched on that a little bit when talking about the investments we could make now to keep people out of harm's way by weathering, weatherizing homes and you know raising them up, up out of uh, you know areas of flood risk. Um, but I'm going to turn to Danielle now um, to share a little bit more um, about an, another vision for the coast. Thanks, Kristen. Yeah, so we can all agree that our communities need protection now. Um, our region presents significant risk to flooding and coastal storm surge. Um, however, it's really hard to think about waiting for protection for 20 years. Um, and so we can't solely rely on the Army Corps' plan. And there have been some troubling comments from commissioners' court saying, you know, if we signal that we want to pursue other um, opportunities in conjunction, will that signal to Congress that we're not fully invested in this project, that we won't get money for this project. And that's really troubling. We need um, to, to implement as many solutions now as possible to get people out of harm's way. And we see time and time again that non-structural solutions, elevating homes, as Chase has discussed, um, hardening them to uh, wind damage and rain damage, everything else that storm surge won't protect against. Um, you know, those investments are uh, massively needed right now. In addition, we see that green infrastructure and nature-based infrastructure and hybrid infrastructure can do a lot to protect communities while also providing multiple benefits um, to the areas. We need to um, we need to properly value our natural infrastructure and not build in wetlands, as Kristen said, and protect our oyster reefs and, um, and coastal, wet, uh, coastal wetlands as well in order to provide protection to communities. Um, living shorelines are also a great solution for, for smaller storms, but all of these things have to come together, you know, non-structural solutions, those nature-based features um, not planning our communities in a way that's smarter and doesn't put people in harm's way. Um, it's really going to take uh, a holistic planning effort to be able to um, provide that protection more immediately than what the Ike Dyke and the Army Corps plan can, um, can provide. We also um, need to strictly enforce any kind of industrial plant um, building codes. We need to identify any facilities that are not in compliance um, and figure out which facilities are posing the biggest risk to communities um, and make sure that the best available technologies and science and uh, practices are used in order to ensure that if there's storm surge that their facilities will not be harming the communities nearby. Um, so it's, it's not an easy problem to solve, but there are other solutions that could be implemented on a quicker time scale at a fraction of the cost. And we shouldn't lose sight of that. Um, we shouldn't be thinking of this project as a silver bullet that can, that's going to protect everyone because you know, what's going to happen in the 20 years time that, you know, best case scenario that this happens. So start investing in the short and medium term solutions that can provide uh, protection quicker. Um, so I know we're running out of time, so I want to hand it over. And I'd uh, like to just ask Joni, if you're available, Joni, um, ask you the same question about um, your vision for the coast, but like from the perspective of somebody who lives in Galveston, um, what would you like to see out of this um, project or out of this kind of commitment of investment and imagination? Absolutely, I appreciate that. And so, yeah, I've lived in Galveston since 2013. And when I decided to move here, I also accepted the risk of living on a barrier island. And I knew any hard structure, no matter how small, even bulkheads has an impact on the environment. And so I think all of the solutions have been talked about. We need to restore our wetlands and our oyster reefs. We need to raise our homes. We need to build away from our critical dune system. Uh, recently attended a meeting of our city council and our mayor and city manager, and they were speaking about how many building permits they have for Galveston. I think Danielle touched on that. We don't need to build more homes. We need to protect people. We have a beautiful 
natural area on the island, and this structure will have unknown consequences, especially on our base system. All the impacts to people, the pollution. Can you imagine two mile structure being built across the bay and what it will do to tourism? Galveston is an island that survives on tourism. I mean, we could just continue on and on with all the potential impacts from this project. But when we think about it, it's been 14 years since Hurricane Ike. And what have we done in the last 14 years besides focus on this project? And uh, John, I'd like to turn to you and ask you the same question, um, but from the perspective of someone living in Port Arthur. Um, when you think, you know, when you hear $31 billion, 20 years, like what's your vision of how we could spend that time and that money for your community? Well, the question I have is, first of all, who's going to pay? Because some of those people don't have that means to pay and is an inequitable distribution of who's going to carry that tax burden. A large number of these people don't own homes. They live in public housing. They live in subsidized housing, which is non-taxed and non-taxable. So how do they pay? You know, they, they are low income, so they don't pay that way either. And also, what's going to happen in terms of helping them with the problems, as I said, within the bowl? Within the, you, can, you can keep the golf out, but what happens in the bowl? That's what happened to Port Arthur at Harvey. Our system basically failed us, and water was diverted into areas and communities from uh, areas that were of non-color into areas of color. And that's where some of the worst flooding was in my community. So those solutions, while they may be helpful on some hand to some seemingly, does not address the problems of the people who are going to be mostly, who are gonna be largely affected. The people who, as Chase said, have no voice. They have no one to respond to, to help them. So we're, once again, this is a, a, a question, which is the question of how do we, protect ourselves that's still looking for an answer. And the answer isn't creating a dike to try to wall it off because there are too many unintended consequences. And that's simply not going to work. We have to do just as Joni said, you can't build in these low lying places. If you build there, you're gonna to have to elevate. And then also we've got to look at the insurance aspect, which we all pay for in higher rates. So we're, we're spreading the damage out more instead of really reducing. And once again, at some point in time, you can't beat mother nature. She finds a way to, to get you one way or the other. All we can do is try to manage it and work in harmony with it. But this is not a harmonious solution. This is once again, a, an answer in search of a question that really doesn't exist. Thank you. Um, we're gonna turn now to questions and answer or questions that have been coming in um, into our little question and answer portal on Zoom. Um, but before we get there, I just wanna um, remind you that there's a sign up form. Um, I just put it again in the chat. Um, there's a lot of boxes you can check if you wanna be involved in any specific ways, including just knowing when um, there's opportunities to participate in public processes. There were a lot of comment periods before the Army Corps of Engineers. There's still opportunities to participate in front of a lot of different, um, different decision-making bodies um, with some level of authority over aspects of this project. And um, this list, one thing we will do with it is um, use it to keep people informed about those opportunities. Um, so, and, and speaking of decision makers and opportunities to participate, um, we're going to have um, quarterly meetings open to the public. Um, we have these planning meetings regularly and we, we don't wanna be the only ones um, there. And we'll also use this as an opportunity to continue to ask, answer some of the questions that have been asked today and new questions that arise as you learn more. Um, with regard to um, who these decision makers are, that's something that we will specifically cover in that meeting. And that's on June 15th, I believe. And if you're interested in attending that, um, the sign up form you know, gives you a little opportunity to check the box about that. Um, and we'll also advertise it publicly before, um, before that happens. So now turning to questions, I'm gonna um, ask Danielle Garcia to, it asks some of the questions that have been dropped in our question and answer box. All 
right. So some of the questions that um, I've seen, um, for example, is do we know how this impacts our ferry system in Galveston Bay? And if anyone can speak to that, um, just let, let them know. <laughs> Um, and then if we don't have an answer, then we can always um, look for the answer and try to get back. So if whoever asked this question wants to leave their contact information, we could get back to you with that answer as well. Um, this is a question for Danielle. Um, so where are we at in the coastal barrier process in terms of Congress pushing it forward? And do you have any suggestion for environmental orgs or community members on how to um, help the situation in any way? Yeah, of course, thank you, Danielle. Um, so there, every other year, it's a biennial um, bill called WERDA, the Water Resources and Development Act. Um, every other year, there's one that's usually passed in Congress and, um, and where does authorize big Army Corps projects for construction? They do not um, appropriate any funds to Army Corps projects, um, but it's the next step in the, um, in the process for this Coastal Texas study. There's been both a House bill and a Senate bill that have been introduced, and they've both um, passed out of committee, out of their respective committees, and they're waiting for a vote on the House and Senate floor. Um, so you can contact your house rep or your state senator or your senator. And if you have concerns about this project, you may raise those with them. Um, but to be honest, we we believe that this will pass through um, just with the discussions uh, that we've had. So that's that's just one step in the process. The next would be um, if if this is included in the WERDA of 2022 then it still needs to get appropriations from Congress. Um, and so it's not inevitable that it will get 65% uh, of the $31 billion appropriated by Congress. That's a huge amount of money. And so um, that's the next step in the process. And you can, again, um, contact your representatives. Um, so, you know, there's many players in this. Um, the residents of the five counties that are gonna be taxed they will, um, they will eventually, if this continues on, will have to vote on whether they want to see a tax increase to cover that 35% local cost share. Um, so, you know, there's other, there's other points in the process where you can have your voice be heard. This isn't the last time we're going to go through um, all the different decision makers, as Kristen said at our next meeting. Um, and there's many ways to participate. Um, even showing up to the Gulf Coast Protection District meetings, they're only held in person right now. We've been fighting to get them to open them up virtually, but even raising concerns and questions at the, their regular meetings, they meet monthly, um, is another venue where you can voice concerns or raise questions about this project. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, I think another question I see is, um, I'm sorry, um, who will be asked to approve the environmental impact studies and what is the status of the legislation, which I'm pretty sure you just answered. Um, so if you have any more thoughts or if anyone else has any more thoughts um, to speak to this question. All right, um, and I think as far as questions go for right now, this is all I'm seeing. I feel like most of the questions we've addressed in our lectures today, but if there are any other questions, please feel free to leave them um, and we'll, we will answer them. Um, I don't know if any of the panelists have questions for each other. Well, I, I was I can hop in and answer the question about who will be asked to approve the environmental impact studies. Um, the the EIS is is not technically speaking a decision making document. It's really 
it forces them to evaluate the environmental impacts and then they, they provide it to the public and receive comments. It doesn't dictate at the end of the day whether you give it a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Um, but they, they do have burdens. They do have to, to do a, a true EIS. They do have to look at everything appropriately. And, and if not, then, um, then you can challenge it in court, for example, to say that it was deficient. Um, I, I hope that answers that, that, that question. It, it, it is, it's a bit confusing, for sure. All right, did any of the other panelists have questions for each other? Or maybe some last minute thoughts they wanted to get out. I'd just like to comment on the, what Chase just said. And you know, part of the problem is with that is that these statements that they issue are either considered draft forms or they're considered guidelines, which doesn't mean you have to necessarily go by them. Well, when you're talking about the impact on communities, on the environment, what good is having information that should guide or should help you in that decision if it has no weight or impact? You know, the human considerations and the environmental considerations have to be tantamount because we depend on the earth to live. We depend on our environment to live. And we also depend on the impact of these things against people. As uh, Chase said earlier, and as I can tell you about here in Port Arthur, as well as some of the other coastal cities, that there are large numbers of people still who have gotten, who have, whose homes have been damaged from not just Harvey, but from even Rita and Ike back in 2005, 2008, that have not received help that they need. And the system simply doesn't work. I and some other uh, Houston area people got together and we wrote a letter to HUD with regard to that, how the money was not being equitably distributed. And they looked into our concerns and our accusations and found that to be true. So as long as we have some of these same folk making these decisions with the money and how it's going to be spent and not taking into full consideration and, and really utilizing that in their process, the impact on people in the environment, then we're gonna keep getting these types of decisions that don't help either one of us or help either party. They're, gonna, they're not going to do what's needed and then someone's going to always be left out. There's no equity or justice in any of that. Thank you, everybody. Um, I, I think we're done for the day. Um, I know this is a lot to take in. Oh, Danielle, I see your hands up. Yeah, I was gonna ask Chase, I don't think you covered this um, in your portion, but I heard that there were a couple of communities that were outside of the, um, the barrier, the ring levee system uh, in Galveston. And I was wondering if you could discuss a little bit about those communities that are outside of the project footprint. Sure, so um, the, the ring barrier on Galveston Island, um, it, it will form a, as John described, a bowl um, a wall around the east side of the island, the east end. Um, it, it, there are communities um, to the west of the west end of that barrier on Galveston Island. My best friend, my college roommate, um, his apartment building will uh, be just on the outside of the protected um, part of the bowl. Um, and then as you go further down the island, um, you know, anyone who lives or has property that direction will be outside of it. And then um, across um, the way on, on Bolivar Peninsula, um, none of that community, of course, would be within that footprint. Um, a big concern for anyone outside the footprint of the, the ring system or the, the, the huge barrier at the entrance of the bay is what happens to the water that's pushed up those um not so natural um things that water has to go somewhere it's not just going to dissipate into the wall and, and evaporate um it will get pushed probably to the left or the right um and it, it's going to end up somewhere it will find a way as john says um to, to get somewhere um and so anybody who is kind of just outside that footprint um 
you know, a big fear is that they're going to actually have more water um, at the end of the day, possibly because of all the water being pushed to the side. Um, and it's kind of the, that, the same thing along um, Galveston Bay, the west side, um, with the barriers of Dickinson Bay and, and um, Clear Lake, that, that if you're not protected by those, the water is going to go somewhere and it's going to be pushed somewhere. Um, and, and all of those communities, um, I think, are going to be at risk of, of seeing flooding caused by this new infrastructure. Thank you. And we have just two minutes left. Um, so there's two more questions I wanted to at least start to answer. One is where can I find a copy of this presentation? We will be um, sharing a recording of this after editing it a little bit, just um, for formatting sake. Um, so look for that, I think, next week. Um, and then the other question, I feel like we could probably and maybe should have another um, like meeting to address this, but it's what are alternatives to the Ike Dike that work with nature? Um, I know this group has a lot to offer in terms of answering that question. And I don't know if anyone wants to take one minute, like give the one minute version and that could like at least lay the seeds for a future presentation. Not to call on Danielle Goshen too much, but I feel like you might be a good person to answer this. <laughs> Well, I think it's a combination of a lot of the items that we have already discussed here today. If you look at um, countries that are low lying that have dealt with um, flooding and storm surge and sea level rise um, that are really advanced in flood mitigation like the Netherlands and like um, Singapore, they're really turning to a more natural nature based way of planning of allowing setbacks. It's really hard in um, in areas like Galveston Bay that are very built up to, to start from that, but we need to start planning to live with water a little bit better. We, need, we can't be building, continuing to build um, the way we have been that are close to areas that are prone to flooding and storms. We need to invest in our natural systems to really value nature and allow it to have that protective value that we see. Um, and we need to, uh, implement non-structural solutions that can um, help elevate homes that are already existing and take them out of the floodplain and also harden them from, uh, from wind damage during hurricanes. Uh, it's a combination of all of these things that really allow us to work with nature instead of um, fighting against it constantly. So it's, it's not just one solution. I think that, you know, thinking about an Ike Dike as one single solution is really attractive um, it seems, you know, like uh, it will solve all of our problems, but uh, the fact is that we haven't seen evidence of that. And having a more holistic approach that incorporates all of these things, non-structural solutions, working with nature, having hybrid infrastructure um, can help us work more um, with nature than against it. Thank you so much. Thanks to our panelists. Thanks to everyone who, who attended. Um, I yeah, look forward to continuing this conversation with all of you, and I hope you have a good afternoon. Thank you.